because nobody has ever been satisfactorily able to explain this to me. It's like they simply couldn't avoid it. Okay, does anybody remember that scene in Blackadder? Okay, the Blackadder's at number four, where he's explaining to uh, Baldrick why it's happened, and Baldrick says, because the Germans are trying to take over the world, and Blackadder says, no, look at the map, Baldrick. Okay, look at all those parts colored red. <laughs> okay, and there's the German possession in Africa. They have, they have a sausage factory in Tanganyika. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody can explain it. Liberalism, if you like, effectively ended. It's not a coincidence, by the way, that in England, the two major parties from about the middle of the 18th century up to the early part of the 20th century were the conservatives and the liberals. The liberal party effectively disappeared with the arrival of the Labour Party. Okay? It, it, it sort of survived on a life support machine for a number of years before, I don't know, transmogrifying into social democratic and whatever it is, which means nothing. If you forget the liberal part, it's just you know, for, for old times' sake, the liberal part to disappear completely. Uh, with the result is that in most Western countries today, uh, there is no liberal party in the classic sense of that term. There is no party that values freedom and prioritizes it. The Conservative Party certainly doesn't do it. The Conservative Party actually has the distinction of not actually being conservative, which is really stunning. I think that's quite clever. Okay? Maybe they should change their name to the whatever you're having yourself. <laughs> and RS, I remember an advertisement some years ago between the poll where they were trying to recruit some, some members and it says, we have a place for everyone. I thought, great, fantastic. What does that say about your party, right? Doesn't matter what your beliefs are and so on. But we know what that means because between the polls only policy is getting, obtaining, and retaining power. Which, by the way, is the policy of every party when it comes right down. So let me not put the knife into Fianna Fáil, but they were kind of open about it. Anyway, sorry, I'm distracted. Okay, so there were parties. We don't have one. There is no. There are no liberal parties anywhere, right? And we haven't effectively had a liberal party anywhere in either continental Europe or these two offshore islands since 1914. We have never had a liberal party in Ireland. There's never been one. Fine Gael is not one. Labour is not. The recidivist, Sinn Féin, or not one, okay? There's no one. I mean, hey, you want to start one? Feel is open, go ahead. Lots of room out there to start one. And why is that? It is really peculiar when you think about it. Well, not so peculiar because political parties are heavily uh, recruited and staffed by people who think they know what's good for you. They know better than you what's good for you. Libertarians say, no. They may say, I think what you're doing is really stupid, and I very often do, right? But in the end, if you really want to be stupid and do stupid things and are prepared to accept the consequences, <coughs> go ahead. <coughs> Don't mind. If you're an adult, that's the cost of being an adult, right? But political parties really do think these people, they say, I want to be in public service. I go, why? Why do you want to do that? There's a classic scene in a, in a not particularly good film, a version of Kidnapped. Uh, starring Michael Caine, came out I think mid 70s, maybe early 80s, in um, which he plays uh, he plays the, the Jacobite on the run. It's after 1745, after the uh, 45 rebellion, and there's a scene with, with his uh, with his with his lover on the moor. It's very dramatic, and he says something like, "I would die for Scotland," and she says, "I think it's one of the great put-down lines ever. Who wants you to? <laughs> Who wants you to? Right? I will look after you." I will do all of these wonderful things for you. And the answer is, I had a mom and dad, and it was great, and they were terrific. They're dead now, I don't need another one. Okay, I can look after myself. Right? That's what liberalism is all about. Now, unfortunately, liberalism now means, and especially in America, and this is the important, it means effectively the socialist or the quasi-socialist or the we're going to order your life for you and we're going to have money for everybody and goods for everybody and, and free hospitals for everybody and food for everybody and a wonderful life for everybody. Don't worry about where we're going to get all the stuff from. That's another thing. Don't worry about it because there are all these rich people out there and they're going to pay for it and so on. No. Yeah, but that's kind of what liberalism means now. That's not what it meant, of course, in the 19th century. So we come then to libertarians. And libertarians are, again, those crazy people, like myself, and Rob over there, <laughs> my support group, okay. uh, and, and a few others. I think there may be, I don't know, Rob, I've got 100 in Ireland. Are there? Yeah, you, yeah. yeah you, maybe a few more. <laughs> maybe, maybe 102 on a good day, I yeah. don't know. Uh, who think 
seriously, that liberty is the fundamental value in social and political life. It's not the only important thing. Can I make that point here? Right? I mean, people sometimes accuse libertarians of not being concerned about wealth or happiness or all of the other things and so on. But of course they are. I mean, to say, to say that libertarian is a fundamental value is simply to say, but it's as if to say water is fundamental to life. But who in their right minds thinks that a steady diet of water and maybe a little bit of bread is a rich and enduring diet? That's crazy, right? But it's fundamental. Unless you have that at the core of your system, unless you respect your, your, unless you respect other people's right to make foolish decisions, there is only one caveat, but I'll come to that in a second, okay? And they respect yours, you cannot have a free and flourishing society. And that caveat, of course, is simply this. There is a limit to what you can do. You cannot initiate physical violence against the person and property of another human being. And I say initiate. You can't start a fight. Look, I sometimes say, libertarianism is so simple-minded that even a child understands it. Two children are fighting in the playground, and the teacher comes along. And one of the stories you will always get is, he started it. <laughs> I didn't start the fight. He started it. So even though you looked at it and you saw two people fighting, one of them started it, the other reacted. There is no problem reacting to violence and defending yourself. You have a perfect right to do that. What you don't have a, do, a right to do is, of course, to initiate violence against the person or property of another human being. It's really, really simple. Even children understand it. Right? They even understand it when it comes to playing with toys. Right? They say, it's, it's my toy. Right? Or I played with this first, you can't have it, there's plenty of other toys, help yourself, and so on, but I have this now. I even understood this when I was a precocious brat myself. There's people, there are kind people who will still say, I'm still a precocious brat, <laughs> but they're wrong. <laughs> when, I was, uh, when I was very young, okay, about 160 million years ago, uh, I ended up, I don't know how, this is because I live in kind of Angela's Ashes life. Okay, and everything was great. We didn't get colored until the 1960s. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I, I somehow came into possession of a bag of sweets, right? Not just one sweet, which is my normal dose, and then only if I use extreme persuasion on my father and so on, but a bag of sweets. And my mother intimated to me that it would be really nice if I shared this with my little sister who was five years younger. <laughs> and I said, whose sweets are these? <laughs> <laughs> and my mother said, well, they're yours. And said, in which case, I decline. I probably, <laughs> probably phrased it somewhat differently, but that was the problem. And to my mother's determined credit, she didn't do what many parents would have done, which is to confiscate, like our government will do, my <laughs> <laughs> and give them to somebody else. Because that, in the end, by the way, is what all politics is about. And that's why libertarianism is very interesting, because if you think about it, in almost all the discussions, I'm going to finish very shortly, in almost all the discussions you would have about political philosophy, the question is, what's the best form of government? Governance. Is it this? Is it that? Okay, is it a democracy or is it an autocracy or whatever it might be? But of course, that really raises a prior question. Why should you have any form of governance at all? other than that, the one that, to which you've explicitly agreed. And you might say, oh my god, if we didn't have that, we'd have chaos. And you look around the world, we live and you say, well, hey, we're doing a pretty good job with government, right? Now, uh, here's the thing. If you think about it, almost everything you do throughout the entire day is anarchic. That is to say, you don't necessarily do it because you fear penalties or because you want particular rewards. You relate to your friends in a completely anarchic fashion. That is to say, you relate to them as one human being to the other. You make it up as you go along. Your conversation is anarchic. In fact, your language is anarchic. Nobody designed English. Nobody designed German. Nobody says what shall be in and what shall be out, apart from the pronoun warriors who are absolutely evidently insane. But we know these people, right? God help them. They need, they need our assistance in prayers. <laughs> um, but by and large, no. Almost everything we do is anarchic. And indeed, if the police went on strike in the morning, you know what would happen? Pretty much nothing, because right now, uh, most of, the, most of the reason most of us do most things or refrain from evil things is not because we fear punishment or because there's a real threat to the board. Right now, actually, crime does pay because your chances of getting caught are very slim. 
Okay? Your chances of being tried and convicted if you're caught are very, very slim. Your chances of actually being punished in any significant way if you're caught, if you're tried, if you're convicted are remarkably slim. So there's career advice for you. Criminality. Okay? <laughs> Just do it, do it big and bold. Okay? Okay? Don't be mean. Small ones tend to get caught in the thing. Just steal really if you're going to do it. That way you have a much better chance of getting away with it. Um, if your TV is stolen, uh, I mean, the cops will come around. That's if they're not too busy doing other things, which they very often are. About three days later, and they will ask you for your registration number, and then you will say piteously, what are the chances of my TV being recovered? And after they start choking with laughter, <laughs> they will say, hmm, I don't know, about 2% recovery, and you go, right, great, terrific. And what do I do in the meantime? I don't have a TV. And they go, well, you know, you've got your house insurance. And that's interesting, don't you think? Despite the fact that we pay an enormous amount of money for protection by the police. By the way, the police in Ireland are largely dating service. Did you ever notice that? Men and women walking down the street on their mobile phones. It's great. I hope you're happy paying for them, by the way. Uh, they're not doing much on the defending side. But anyway, uh, you don't get much protection. In fact, if you want to protect yourself, you do it yourself. You get a burglar arm, or you get a phone watch, or you make sure you've got bolts in your windows and doors, and big thorny bushes, and a dog that barks, and you take out insurance. You take out insurance so that when somebody does make your TV, you actually end up with a TV back. Right? You pay all of that, by the way, on top of the extravagant amounts of money that the government takes from you to protect you. Do you know, by the way, that the government has no contact with you? You cannot sue the government for failure to protect you? But if you had a private agency who was doing it for you, you could. You know why? <laughs> because you'd have a contract. Who here has a contract with the government? Do you remember signing a contract with the government that says that in return for their ability to tell you what to do, and especially to tell you what not to do, and to take your money from you, you promise to be really nice and behave yourself and not raise any really bold <coughs> questions and question their authority? I don't remember being asked. I was never asked. You never will be asked. Not by any political system. So, ladies and gentlemen, it comes down to this. Uh, the really important question is not what is the best system of government, the question is why should we have any particular system of governance at all, and why these, and what is the justification for it, and why is it that some particular group of people <coughs> get to tell us what to do, and we are obliged legally to do it under pain of penalty, threat of force, or the actual use of force. And for this privilege of having other people tell us how to live our lives, we get to pay for it. Isn't that great? Doesn't that make you sort of feel really warm? It doesn't to me. I'm a libertarian anarchist. I hate government. Okay? I despise all of those who work in government and work for government. And I threaten my sons that if they ever worked for the government, I would disown them. I would rather they went to school as male prostitutes. Okay? Not that they would make much money. <laughs> For the government, at least they would be honest. Okay? As, as the prostitute said to her client, I'm going to finish in this. Good night, she said, it's been a pleasure doing business with you. of John Rawls' political philosophy. For those of you, I, I know there's at least one person here who has heard of John Rawls, because he's in my fourth year contemporary political theories class. Um, and I've had three lectures on Rawls already. Um, he's one of the most prominent political philosophers of the 20th century. Um, he's commonly thought of as a liberal uh, political philosopher, or primarily a liberal egalitarian, um, as he's concerned with liberty and equality. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of try to walk through essentially what he does in his 
uh, seminal book, The Theory of Justice. Um, it's a 600 page book, so I won't get through much of it. Um, and sort of hopefully leave you with a vague idea of what John Rawls is trying to do. Um, so, what is he trying to do? The first thing he's trying to do is he wants to try and figure out principles of what he calls social or distributive justice. Um, he says, justice is the first virtue of social institutions as truth is of systems of thought. Um, so for, for Rawls, these principles of justice are the principles on, based on which we should design our society, uh, how we socially engage with each other, our political, economic, and social structures should be designed based on principles of justice. These principles are the, the principles that sort of determine how we structure society. They tell us who has which rights, which obligations, who gets sort of which public goods, material goods, etc. It figures out how to distribute the benefits that we accrue from being in society. Um, and he says, although a society, and this is important, he thinks a society is a cooperative mutual venture, a venture for mutual benefit. The, the point of society, the reason we do this sort of society thing, is we all get something out of it. Um, and he wants to try and put together principles that make sure that we still are all getting something out of it. So he says that although society is a cooperative uh, venture for mutual advantage, he then says it's typically marked by a conflict as well as by an identity of interests. Um, so for Rawls, society should be this cooperative mutual uh, venture. Um, it needs to be uh, something that we're all benefiting from. Um, we've known sort of since at least sort of Thomas Hobbes that um, the point of society is that we get something out of it. Um, Hobbes thought that what we got out of it was security and that's it. That we get to avoid the nasty British short um, state of nature or state of war. Um, Rawls wants to go a bit further than this and say actually no, what we get out of society is more than just uh, defence. It's more than just that we aren't going to get arbitrarily murdered in our sleep, but that actually by working together, by cooperating, um, as a society, we can get, uh, we can improve our own material welfare, material well-being. We can have a more full, flourishing life. Um, but that we need principles to figure out how we're going to do that. And um, the reason for this is essentially what I like to call sort of um, I'm the only one, sort of what I the basic sort of liberal problem. Um, and Rawls puts this in terms of sort of David Hume's political circumstances of justice. So this is the idea that. People have preferences, they want certain things, they want to live their life in a certain way, and that there is some degree of resource scarcity. There's not so much uh, material stuff available that we can all just have whatever we want, whatever we wanted, but there's not, that we're not living in Mad Max, right? That we're not all just constantly gonna be trying to murder each other to, to get stuff because there's just not enough to go around. So there's sort of moderate scarcity, and then secondly, that we're all neither angels nor devils, right? We're not, uh, we're not angels, we're not constantly looking out for other people. We're not willing to constantly sacrifice our own interests for others. But at the same time, we're not absolute dickheads about everything, right? We're not gonna be trying to steal everything from everybody else. We're not gonna be constantly murdering and attacking each other, that actually it's possible for us to cooperate. So this basic liberal problem is that we have moderate scarcity, we disagree about what we want, but we think that it's a good idea for us to cooperate and work together, so we need to figure out a solution to this. We need to figure out a solution to, we're ineliminably going to disagree, but we, need, we also think that we want to cooperate. And um, so this is this sort of basic liberal problem. Rawls wants to solve this. He wants to give us principles for how we can design a society where we can all live our own lives, we can pursue our own interests, we can uh, have some degree of, of liberty to do what we want with our life, but that we're also all benefiting from this uh, mutual cooperation, that we're getting something out of this, and that we're recognizing that we're all free and to some degree equal. Um, so before Rawls, in his sort of primary, um, the, the, the people that he's primarily sort of responding to are uh, utilitarians. So he sets himself up essentially as a response to utilitarian political thought. And this utilitarianism was one of the sort of the dominant 
and um, ways of trying to answer this question of why should we set up our society that we're in this mutually beneficial cooperative venture um, before Rawls came along. And it essentially said we should, some, some version of we should maximize utility. There's a lot of different versions out there. Um, but Rawls sort of says, okay, I want to reject utilitarianism. I think that it doesn't respect the difference between individuals. It aggregates us as a society and it tells us Okay, you get X amount of utility, you get X amount, you get X amount, and that's it. And we don't really get to make the individual choices that we really think are important. So he rejects utilitarianism because it doesn't respect the differences between individuals, um, in his view. But he does think that it, it has a sort of basic, there's intuitive uh, plausibility to aspects of utilitarianism. He thinks that we need to worry about consequences. We can't just say, okay, everybody gets to live their life as they like. We need to worry also about where that ends up and the, the consequences of where we end up. And he says, all ethical doctrines worth our attention take consequences into account in judging rightness. And um, one which did not would simply be irrational or crazy. And um, so he wants to worry about consequences, but he also wants to worry about how we get there. So what he's trying to do is develop a systematic alternative to utilitarianism um, for designing the basic social, political, and economic structure of society that determines how the benefits of our mutual cooperation are distributed, which is a really long-winded and boring way of saying he's worried about liberty, he's worried about ensuring that the individual is respected, that we're able to pursue our own life goals, um, but he's also worried about equality. He's worried about ensuring that everybody is getting uh, something out of this um, and that we're not all sort of just sort of left to starve in a gutter if we are a bit unlucky or we make a bad decision at some point. So in order to do this, he sort of to try and come up with principles that can do this, he has a particular methodological approach which he is quite famous for, and um, it's called the original position. It's essentially a social contract uh, approach, um, and he proposes essentially a hypothetical contract. He says, okay, let's um, suggest a sort of a, if we all imagine that we're behind a veil of ignorance and we don't know certain things uh, about ourselves, who we are, what we want from life, what our goals are, how much money we've got, um, what gender we are, what color our hair is, etc. And we don't know certain things about ourselves. And now let's think up some principles for designing our society. And these are the principles that he thinks we should go with because that those are the principles that we would choose behind this field of ignorance, that, we would, that this is a hypothetical contract, a hypothetical consent. What would people agree to um, in under given circumstances um, to try and get to fair principles? And he calls this theory justice as fairness. And um, the two principles he comes up with, um, the first one is the, the most extensive scheme of basic liberties compatible with a similar scheme for all others. Um, and the second principle is in two parts, because he couldn't do anything simply. And um, social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are A, attached to positions and offices open to all, and B, reasonably expected to be to everyone's advantage. So this first principle is that um, everybody gets as many basic sort of liberties um, as possible that's compatible with everybody having the same set of basic liberties. Um, and he thinks that this is going to essentially look something similar to the sort of the list of basic sort of social or civil and political uh, liberties that the sort of the Western world has roughly settled on um, uh, in by the, the 70s. So you're, think, you're thinking of, sort of freedom of speech, freedom of association, some degree of property rights, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Free uh, ability to be involved in uh, government these sorts of things. Um, so your basic civil and political liberties, as many of them and as much of them as is possible that they're not infringing on other people's rights. So he thinks sometimes rights will come into conflict, for example, free speech and um, a right to privacy is often inside of <coughs> conflict. Um, the media, the press have a right to free speech to sort of say what they want, but sometimes that infringes on other people's um, right to privacy, when people start digging around in other people's private lives, and there's a conflict in rights there. Rawls thinks the way to figure this out is everybody gets as, as extensive a set of liberties that's compatible with everybody having the same ones. So equal basic liberties for all. 
The second principle is to, to deal with sort of social and economic issues. So he says fair equality of opportunity. So some sort of system whereby everybody has essentially equal access to uh, jobs and positions where they can, no matter sort of what uh, sort of social or economic situation they're born into, they have the potential they could go on and achieve essentially whatever they want so long as it's within their capacity to do it. Um, and then secondly, that um, any, this is this is famous, what's known as the difference principle, that any deviation from economic inequality has to benefit the worst off in society. Um, so essentially, that you can't deviate from economic inequality if it's to the detriment of other people. So if one person is getting very, very rich at the, the loss, to the detriment of other people in society, then Rawls suggests we can redistribute from that very, very rich person to the other people to ensure that everybody is benefiting, so that nobody is losing out from being in this thing we call society. Um, he, these, these two principles are what he calls lexically prioritized. So you can't uh, compensate someone for a loss in rights, in their basic liberties, um, with economic goods. So I can't take away your right to free speech um, and say, it's okay, here's a big bundle of money, and you've been compensated. That's, for all, that's not okay. You have your, your basic, uh, equal basic liberties, and then we figure out the economic stuff um, after that. Um, and that's, that, those are the two principles that Rawls thinks we should use to, to design what he calls sort of the basic structure of society. So sort of the basic social, political, economic institutions. Um, he doesn't really have much to, to say based on that about you know, what government are we going to have? Are we going to have, he sort of thinks we'll be in a vaguely sort of liberal, democratic, western country, but he's, he's not really talking about what sort of government we're going to have of the day, what's the regime going to be. He's primarily concerned with how we're going to set up the really sort of basic fundamental um, institutions. Um, there's a lot more that could be said uh, about John Rawls. Um, that's sort of the basic uh, whistle-stop tour of, of Rawlsian political thought. Um, and there's a lot more that could be said, and there's a lot more that has been said. As I mentioned, he wrote uh, a theory of justice, a 600-page book. Um, he has a second 600-page book, Political Liberalism, um, and he has a couple of other books. Um, he's not writing anymore. He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, there's a lot more that could be said, and a lot more that has been said. People have been debating what John Rawls was talking about ever since he published the theory of justice in 1971. Um, just sort of the main sort of primary takeaways, a couple of key points before I'll, I'll finish up. Um, his methodological innovation um, of the original position and this idea of hypothetical consent um, is a controversial one. Hypothetical consent, it's not clear that it works. Um, uh, it's not clear that, you know, there's a famous, or well, a good paper by Ronald Dworkin where he basically says a hypothetical contract is not a contract at all. Um, and that's potentially a fair point. Um, that hypothetical consent doesn't really mean anyone has ever actually consented to any of this, so why should we care? Um, Brian Barry suggests, well, Rawls doesn't actually need hypothetical consent. He has a bunch of reasons why he thinks these are good principles, and hypothetical consent doesn't really matter. If, you, if we have good reasons for accepting it, let's just do that. Um, uh, secondly, um, he is concerned with uh, liberty. He thinks everyone is of equal moral worth. Everybody should be free. He wants everybody to be free to, to pursue their own life goals. He, wants, he doesn't want um, society to be telling us um, what we should do with our lives. Um, he wants us to be free to be a political theory lecturer or a beach bum or you know, a prostitute theory potentially if you wish. He wants people to be able to pursue their own life, but he also thinks that um, we all need to be getting something out of society, otherwise why would we bother? Um, and he thinks that we can get something out of society, and um, so he's concerned with some degree of egalitarianism. He doesn't want to, he doesn't think we should just entirely equalize everything. He wants people to be able to, if they want to be a, a high-powered business person who earns 
uh, millions of pounds a year, he's, he's okay with that. So long as by earning millions of pounds a year, that person is operating within society, accruing benefits from it, has gained benefits from it over their whole life. He wants everybody to benefit from that. So if one person in society does well, everybody in society does well. Otherwise, what would be the point in doing society? Um, so he's concerned not merely with a sort of a, a negative liberty, of this sort of negative, just leave me alone, let me do what I want. He's also concerned with a positive liberty, that we actually have the stuff to do things. That if I want to be a beach bum, I have the resources to do that, to go live in a camper van, on a beach, surf a bit and smoke some weed, then Rawls is like, you should be able to do that um, within society. And you should be able to benefit from being part of society and keep contributing to it. Um, so, uh, concluding remarks, finish up. Um, and my concluding remarks are definitely not going to be as entertaining as Professor Casey's. And I'm not going to mention prostitution, unfortunately. Um, but essentially, Rawls is trying to construct, he constructs a compelling account of social distributive justice. It's a fairly compelling account of how we should distribute uh, rights, obligation, obligations, and material goods within society. Um, he allows for people to accrue wealth, to, to expand their wealth, to do better, but he wants to ensure that no one gets left behind in society, that no one is left to, to die in a gutter. Um, because they made a bad choice or they got unlucky or I was reading a story today about a man who about six months ago sold a hard drive that had 64, 64 million dollars worth of Bitcoin on it and he is now kicking himself because he sold it six months ago. Um, so he wants to be able to say, yeah that person screwed up but they're not going to starve because they screwed up. Um, we should. <laughs> um, there are a lot of flaws in his thinking. He's definitely got a lot of stuff wrong. Um, but I would contend that at least since 1971, no one has really come up with a better solution um, to these sort of basic liberal problems of diversity and scarcity. I'll finish there. So I do have a bit of a confession to make. I've never had to speak after references to prostitution and John Rawls, so I don't know how this is going to go. Um, I suppose first just thank you to Paul Stock and thank you for, to um, Eunice and to the committee for inviting me. Um, I must admit, I do feel a bit out of a place on this panel. I mean, one, of, one of these things is not like the other, but um, that's all right. I went to Catholic school, so I got used to not fitting in. <laughs> you know, if I get it, maybe you will by the time I'm done speaking. Uh, right, so I'm going to talk about political obligation. And before we sort of talk about what political obligation is, we need to talk about authority. What is it? Um, so authority, I think, in the most basic sense, is the power to issue binding directives on others. Right? The power to tell other people what to do. Um, I quite like authority, but that, that, that's a... Different story for today. And <laughs> um, most of us are quite ambivalent <laughs> about authority, right? Um, when it comes time to pay our taxes, we don't really think about it. We just write the check to the American government or the Irish government. I imagine the case might be a bit different for you, know, Professor Casey. But that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, they never asked me to take it. <laughs> Um, or, you know, when you're driving down the road and sort of someone with a, with a jacket says police on it directs you to stop or to go forward or to turn a specific direction, we just do it. We don't really think about it, right? Um, but see, at the heart of political obligation is the assumption that the state holds a special kind of moral status, right? It does things which other individuals and other institutions cannot do, right? It taxes people, it imprisons people, it goes to war. Um, so at the heart of political obligation is explaining how the state came to have this special moral status. I would argue that sort of any theory of obligation is going to say that political obligation comes about through a bond, right? And it's sort of this bond between the state and the subject. Um, that bond also sort of limits what, who can do what to who, right? Theresa May cannot come to say an American citizen or go to America and say, give me your money, please, or say, join the British Army. 
Um, if she did, we'd probably just sort of give her the side eye, like Tessa Darling can't do that. Um, <laughs> I imagine that's probably what's going on in Brussels right now, but you know. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad these jokes are going over well. Um, <laughs> Right, so, I, and so the, at the heart of it, that is what we are talking about when we talk about political obligation. Um, I'm going to move in now to talking about what I think are four of the most prominent theories of political obligation, um, but also sort of four of the most well known. There are others, but they're crap, and I only have 10 minutes. Um, so, <laughs> minutes so, so, the first theory we're going to talk about is consent. Um, I venture to guess that. Most of you in the room have heard of consent theory, right? Um, in, you know, so c consent theory sort of touches all areas of our lives, right? It can, we can use it in a medical context. We can use it sort of in a sexual context. We can use it in the context of authority. And the fundamental thing about consent is that it is transformative. It turns bodily mutilation into surgery, assault into boxing. Um, and in the case of in the case of uh, the state, well, I would turn something like coercion into a just act. But the question remains, well, how does it do this? Um, and the most basic answer consent theory provides is, well, you agree, right? You've come to the United States, you're an American citizen, or you're an Irish citizen, or you've come to, to Ireland, so you've agreed to abide by certain rules and to do what, um, what the government here has said. Um, sort of consent theory has, has many, many different, um, different sort of offshoots. There's hypothetical consent, which just seems a bit silly, so we won't talk about it. There's, a, there's explicit consent, and there's tacit consent. If you want to speak more about those differences, we can talk about them in the Q&A. Um, but I'm going to move on because I'm running out of time. So our second theory of political obligation would be something called associative duties. Um, and as an associative duties theorist essentially argues there are certain associations that we didn't choose to be a part of, but are so necessary and intrinsic to human life in community that we can't avoid them. Right? Their central example is the family. No one chooses to be part of a family. Many of us had the choice, we wouldn't agree, but it was great for a different day again. Right? But the fact that we are part of a family gives us certain obligations to those family members. You know, I have special obligations to my father that I don't to other people. I have special obligations to my sister that I say don't to any other, um, I was gonna say to any other women, but that might be misconstrued, um, to any other people. Um, these obligations are so intri- uh, um, yeah, these obligations come from being a part of that association. It helps the association run, it helps that association, be, association become what it is meant to be. Um, so, so our third theory, I know I'm running through these, but... Um, our third theory is sort of natural duties theory. Um, natural duties theory is, well, in, in, in involuntary theory of obligation, I'll explain that in a minute. But at the heart of it is the fact that humans are moral agents. We have the power to reason, we have the power to make decisions. The natural duties theorist, theorist argues that because we are moral agents, we have an obligation to support justice, always and everywhere. And to the degree that institutions are necessary to help us support and promote justice, we have an obligation to obey them. Um, now, so I, I should say, I, there is a very big hole, I think, in natural duties theory in that, well, they don't tell us, say, which institutions, right? Presumably there are any number that help us promote justice. But it seems wrong to say, say, I have obligations to America and to Canada, right, if I'm not a Canadian citizen. Um, so it doesn't really limit us in an adequate way. It doesn't limit us in a way that, say, the associative duty or the um, associative duties theory might, and consent cert theory certainly would. Moving on, sort of the um, final, the final um, theory of our obligation would be something called fair play theory. Sometimes you'll see it as fair contribution theory, but the same thing. Um, and the idea here is that there are certain things that are so intrinsic to a good life that it is irrational not to want them. George Closco puts it this way, presumptive public goods 
are goods that everyone is assumed to want regardless of what else they want. Incredible. Another feature of these goods is that you can't achieve them if you're acting alone. These, the goods he has in mind is something like clean air, clean water, national defense, right? Oh god, I just spilled my water on the expensive equipment. Oh, well. um, <laughs> <laughs> right, so we can't achieve them by acting alone. If you're the only one not polluting the air, well, you're not going to have clean air. Um, if you don't want clean air, you're just really being a bit silly, right? Um, so I, I suppose those are sort of the four basic theories of obligation. Um, what do I think? Oh dear. Um, this is a, that's a fascinating question. I think it de depends on the day. But the state, at its core, is an instrumental thing, right? There's nothing that says the state must exist. Communities perhaps could exist without the state, but they can't exist without some sort of organizational structure, some sort of um, structure to say who gets what, when, where, and how. The state is the best structure we've come up with, I would argue, um, or, or is sort of the best structure we've come up with to do that. That being said, I think any theory of, of political obligation should be teleological which is to say it must be ordered towards a, a particular end or a particular function. Um, and I would also say that that end must be distinct from the end or function of any other institution. Right? Because if it was sort of wasn't distinct, I think we would just default to calling the state by the other institution. Um, so that being said, you know, I think the fair contribution theory probably gets us the closest to what any of us would say is an acceptable scheme of obligation, right? Because it's distinct. The state is the only one, say, with the power to protect these public goods adequately. They're certainly the only ones who we would expect to do it. Um, so it, the, again, I think it has a very distinct um, function, a very distinct end. And it's one that we need. It is one that we cannot live without, regardless of whether we consent to it, regardless of whether we want to or not. Um, I'm not that desperate on time, so I don't know if I'll go into my research. But I suppose just in closing, a couple of things to think about, right? Um, so we live in a world where we can't escape authority, right? And we talked earlier about how there is a bond that must exist between the state and between the subject for authority to exist. But what if that bond isn't there? Can you still have authority? Think of cases like the American government in 2003 and 2004, right? During that period of time, the American government um, had deposed Saddam Hussein, had deposed the government of Iraq. And for a period of about 18 months, they exercised authority over the Iraqi people, right? This is sort of a very weird arrangement. This is one that we would otherwise say can't happen. But yet, you're still seeing authority exercised there. A similar thing happened um, to the team, to, with the UN and the East Timorese in 1999 and 2002. So, is this legitimate? Or is, this, or is the state of confined, with authority confined, the sort of political obligation, or the, the normal political obligation structure that we talked about in the beginning. Thank you for laughing at the jokes, you usually don't. So. <laughs> and I will laugh. Thank you. Thank you. So, I've got slides for you. A bit of entertainment. Um, so I was asked to come in and talk about Taoism or Confucianism uh, in relation to politics. They're both quite different. Uh, Confucians are a bit more into authority, into states. Taoists are a bit more anarchistic, libertarians. Um, so anyway, I, I decided to talk about Taoism. Uh, but before I sort of talk about that, oh, there's my slides. Um, how do I move them up and down? Uh, just hit the arrow key. Where's the arrow key? Yeah, it's... Don't put words in. Ah, there's... Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, if we're going to talk about politics, and I'm no expert on Taoism, but I find it interesting. Uh, I don't think anyone <laughs> can be an expert on Taoism. Uh, 
uh, that's sort of the point of Taoism. The Tao is unknowable. It can't be described. Um, but if we're going to talk about politics and political systems, we're going to talk about libertarianism, the state, uh, we're going to talk about roles, liberal egalitarianism, uh, I sort of wanted to start with an environmental context, um, because that's, I suppose, what makes me like Taoism, or what makes me think Taoism has something to offer. So, just a few facts on the environment. No jokes here, it's not really fun. Um, <laughs> at the moment, between 30 and 50% of the Earth's land surface is used in one way or another by humans. Um, the amount of oceans that have been exploited or overexploited has risen in the last century from 10 to 87%. Agriculture um, is creating dead zones in the oceans. It's using up a lot of our land. It's creating about 60% of global biodiversity loss. Um, with climate change, we're facing more and more uh, threats to our agriculture. Um, in 2012, the droughts in 2008 up to 2012 risked 20 to 40% of our global grain and corn harvest. So, a lot of problems uh, with agriculture, about and how it's going to continue to feed us uh, and its impact on the environment. Uh, here's some more facts. 940 cultivated species are threatened. Um, the UN FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, thinks that we might lose a huge amount of our maize, rice, and wheat uh, crops in the future. Uh, coffee yields have dropped 50% in Tanzania um, in the last 50 years, and so on. Water, uh, between 2020, by 2020, they expect between 75 and 250 million people in Africa to suffer uh, from increased water stress. Yields from rain-fed agriculture could be reduced by 50%. Currently, 70% of the world's fresh water is used for irrigation and agriculture. Sea level rises to predict by the end of the century, about two billion people could be climate change refugees due to uh, rising sea levels. This will lead to loss of land, more resource conflict, more scarcity, more refugees. Our population has gone up and up and up. It's considered by one uh, biologist to be a bacterial rate of increase rather than a normal mammalian rate of increase. So they predicted to reach about 10.6 billion by 2050. 125,000 years ago, we had between 10,000 and 100,000 people. No states, I don't think, back then. Um, so for most of human history, I think we would have lived without states uh, in small groupings, but still a society, I guess. 2,000 years ago, tens of millions of people, 1,700, 600 million people. Now we've got 7 billion people. So this is going to increase our resource use, increase our uh, impact on the environment. Extinction rates should bear in mind that 97% of species that have ever existed have gone extinct. Uh, but we do appear to be entering, or have entered, the sixth great extinction event. Uh, so equivalent to the meteorite hitting the dinosaurs and causing them to die off, Human activity seems to be uh, creating the sixth uh, great extinction event where a huge, well, I think they predict about half of uh, the existing species to be extinct by the end of the century. Although, since I made this slide, uh, the news got worse and worse. Martin Rees, uh, the astronomer royal, thinks our chances of reaching the end of the century as a species is about 50-50. So it's, it's pretty disastrous. It's a pretty heavy impact on, uh, on the globe. And part of me thinks that given we're living in an Enlightenment era, you wonder how did this come to be? And part of me thinks that in the Enlightenment, my argument is that in the Enlightenment, we made individual autonomy the centerpiece. It becomes the very thing that all societies are designed to promote are all liberal Western societies and liberal Western economies are designed to promote individual happiness, individual liberty. 
Uh, so the individual is supposed to be a rational human, man originally, who is able to satisfy their own preferences, so long as these did not directly harm others. And this got sort of caught up in our idea of what progress was and what progress is. Economic growth, greater ability to satisfy our own preferences, so long as we're not harming other people, and technological growth. Um, and I think this leads to an extreme type of individualism, and this can result in collective action problems. So collective action problem, the collective action is when we all group together to solve a problem. Um, but often, from an individualistic perspective, you're much better off being a free rider if you can get away with it. So if you can live in the state, but don't pay taxes in the state, you get all the benefits of the roads, security, whatever else the government does. <laughs> but if you don't pay taxes, if you have an Ansbacker account, you'll be much better off. You benefit in both ways. Um, individually, that would make a certain amount of sense if I could get away with it, if I could be a criminal. My father, of course. <laughs> All of us individually pursuing our own goods can create collective action problems. So we all rationally pursue our own good, but collectively it destroys the commons. We pollute the air, we destroy the oceans, we chop down the forests, we ruin uh, biodiversity. So looking at Eastern philosophy, it's not quite as focused on these concepts of progress. In a metaphysical sense, Chinese philosophies seem to ask what should be done rather than what is there. It's not as metaphysically focused. Chinese tradition assumes then that the issue of how to act in the world will exhaust the reaches of philosophy. Um, these are their, the ultimate questions, and this is where Taoism comes from. So Taoism is a mystical philosophy, an anarchistic philosophy, possibly nonsense. Um, <laughs> Uh, or certainly nonsensical. Um, the Tao itself is meant to be the source of all, but it's not a thing. It can't be named. It can't be understood rationally. Uh, it can be a principle or a set of principles. It's the ultimate reality. It's meant to be the way of heaven, beyond personality, even beyond observable and definable existence. It's not a something along with other things in the world. It's prior to all these somethings. But we don't necessarily have to accept all of that or it's just interesting. For me, what's interesting in Taoism as a, an alternative to certain aspects of liberalism is this counseling against excessive interference. So one of the quotes here is, who knows the limit? Does the straightforward not exist? Straightforward changes once again into the crafty, and good changes once again into the monstrous. <coughs> this is the idea that governments and rules and morals and systems, even enlightenment, liberal, individualistic systems, can be transformed and will transform into something monstrous. So for me, what's most interesting, if I were an Aristotelian non-liberal, I'd adopt a teleological idea of institutions or even government. And I'd say, well, we should all aim towards a good rather than aim towards promoting the right or people's <coughs> individual rights. Um, and that's appealing in a sense from an environmental perspective. And I think the Taoist principle um, can give us or can guide us towards a sort of good. So morality and culture are seen as a deviation from the Tao. The master, or the sage, or the wise person, or wise institution, or wise state will act in accordance with the Tao. In knowing the sufficiency of being content, one will constantly have sufficient. One will have enough. So instead of living in a market society where your preferences are determined by big data and sent back to you over social media, or required in order to keep GDP going, Taoists advocate Wu Wei, which is non-interference, 
principle of inaction. Uh, it's not meant to be idleness or inertia. It's meant to be a total receptiveness to reality. So if your wish, they say, is to gain the empire, you should constantly refrain from meddling. By the time you meddle, you are but unequal to the task of gaining the empire. So this principle of Wu Wei, I think, given our environmental perspective, the environmental facts, we need to move towards inaction, towards taking less. So maybe we should all be surfers on the beach. I don't need to travel too far, that's against Taoist principle. If we're near a beach, <laughs> don't get a career. Just smoke weed and be a surfer. Um, I can surf. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to sink. I tend to sink. Tend to sink. In well, Southern California. You need a good board. <laughs> <laughs> so in conclusion, Taoist says, um, Truthful words are not beautiful, beautiful words are not truthful. Good men do not argue, those who argue are not good. Those who know are not learned, the learned do not know. Um, the sage never tries to store things up. The more he does for others, the more he has, the more he gives to others, the greater is abundance. The Tao of heaven is pointed but does no harm. The Tao of the sage is worth without effort. And on that, I will leave it. Sorry, just a question. I'm sorry, I missed your name, the Rosian thing. Yeah, um, Gavin. Yeah, Gavin. Uh, just in regards to the original position, do you not think one of its weaknesses is it assumes sort of contemporary Western values will always come about when viewed from sort of that objective standpoint of this nearly zombie like person? Like, if we look at most political theories throughout history, they seem to lean towards the certainty aspect, so having a very structured, classified society. And just from my knowledge of roles, one of the things that leap, I think, is unjustified. Do you, can you think of the, the leap from from sort of he believes behind this cloak of ignorance, mm -hmm. people are naturally going to come to the uh, same conclusions as modern liberal Western values. Yet, if we look at most of history, people seem not to. Um, yeah. So I mean, I think there's a lot of problems with the original position. Um, it's I always think of it as it's one of those things where it, it's essentially a thought experiment, and if you are sort of an intuition pump, it's like a big machine to try and figure out what we think. Um, and if you twiddle it just a little bit, you get very, very different results. Um, so there's a big problem with you have to you specify it in a very particular way, and this is one of the problems with Rawls is he specifies the original position in a very particular way to get the result that he wants. Um, right, the result that he wants is his two principles because he, he thinks, and part of this is he thinks sort of. At his core, I think he, he liked liberal democracy. He sort of liked um, a lot of aspects of society in which he lived. He thought there were things wrong with it, we could do a bit better, but ultimately he liked a lot of it. So, yeah, a lot of his um, pre uh, assumptions are, are built in there. And that's one of the problems with it. And I think you know, one of them is um, the sort of Western assumption of sort of. Uh, individual autonomy, um, and one of the criticisms of of uh, Rawls is that he doesn't take um, our sort of embeddedness in a society um, seriously enough, and um, that he doesn't care enough about our existence, not just as as sort of atomistic individuals, but as part of a, a greater whole. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think it's, it's a in many ways a fair criticism. That being said, I do think it is the original position is. Uh, it's a, a methodological innovation that is really, really interesting. Um, one of the things I do with my, uh, my fourth year students um, in, sem in their seminar is I write down on bits of paper um, different descriptions of individual persons. Um, and I have a lot of fun doing this. I come up with a lot of really interesting people. Um, <laughs> I had one, one class where the really, really tall black guy was an 18-year-old white lesbian um, <laughs> as a result of this experiment. It was great fun. But basically, I wrap up these little bits of paper and they pull them at random out of a pot. Um, and that is then who they are. They're not allowed to read that. And then we do the original position. We do the experiment. And um, 
they have to try and pretend that they don't they have to they don't know who they're going to be um, and then at the end we sort of normally i sort of try and maneuver the debate a little bit but normally we end up with something resembling Rawls's two principles of justice sometimes they they deviate a little bit from that and um, one of the lessons we learn from that is yeah when you set up the original position like Rawls, you get what Rawls did right and the other is the, these principles actually have good reasons for him to, he thinks there's good reasons to accept them, aside from that he gets there by a particular method. So I guess that was a very long-winded way of saying yes and no, to answer your question. <laughs> yeah, uh, just for the first sorry, with Professor White, was it, or? I think it's Professor Casey. Casey, sorry. Um, uh, just given that what we've heard about, um, was important, it's, just, it's kind of like the logic of questions you're going to be asked, and I presume you're after hearing that. Um, to stay in more what counts with fair play theory and how the state is like an instrument for uh, collective good, and um, what would be the libertarian response to that? Uh, it would be simply to deny it. <laughs> um, right? In other words, the state, um, uh, as a favor you pointed out from the start, human beings have lived together without states for 99.9% .9 of their existence. And somehow, somehow they manage to survive, which is really strange. So if your argument is that without the state we are going to run into destruction, we're not going to have, I couldn't believe I heard it, we're not going to have roads, okay? <laughs> but whenever I hear roads come up in this particular debate, I know, I know I've reached the nadir of the discussion. Right? There's no lower we can possibly go. Uh, the answer is, yeah, we had roads long time before there was ever any blasted state, right? And we have a whole lot better roads than the crappy roads I have around my neighborhood, despite the fact that they at least made taxes if we didn't have a state. Right? Uh, so, so the answer is this. Uh, the, the starting point is all wrong. I mean, um, I'm, I'm not sure if this is particularly relevant to your question. I'll answer it. If it's not, you can come back. Okay. Roads is crazy. This is the most boring book ever written by any human being in the face of this world. Okay? The, the two principles are insane. What they are designed to do is to produce what people on the north bank of the Charles River between Harvard and MIT think, right? which is amazing. It's astonishing that in the original position, nobody knows what he or she is, thinks about anything, or values. They're all chronic amnesiacs. And you are supposed to generate from this some principles of justice and so on. There, why, in other words, why would you not be a risk taker? Why, why is that rule then? Why do they turn out to be comfortable, middle class, salaried, tenured professors in Harvard and MIT? That's what you get when you get Rawls' Principle of Justice. It's hideous, right? It is a book which is widely bought and unread, just like the Bible. <laughs> okay. uh, it generates enormous, enormous amount of literature because nobody can understand what the hell is going on in it. You cannot reconcile the principle of liberty right, and the difference principle. It's just not possible. Either you leave people alone to, it, to live their lives as they wish and to associate. By the way, libertarianism isn't all about, as it were, living in the woods on your own in a bearskin and sort of shooting raccoons. Okay? You are free to associate with other people. You are free to cooperate with other people, which, believe it or not, is what human beings have been doing their whole lives, their existence from whatever it is, five million years ago, 50 million years ago, 10 million, whatever it is. Right? <coughs> they, don't, they didn't need roles to come along and tell them that that's what they needed to do. Okay? Just as John Locke said about Aristotle, Aristotle uh, sorry, God did not make man two-legged and leave it to Aristotle to make him rational. I would say God did not make human beings cooperative and lead to, to a role to figure out how they were supposed to do it. You cannot get the principle of liberty, his first principle, and the difference principle working together. Right? They just won't fit. It's Humpty Dumpty, okay? All the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put those two principles together again. End of story. <laughs> Time to put Rawls to bed. Goodbye. He's dead. Thanks be to God. He's still alive. Right? Okay? Uh, he, he modifies his position so badly and so poorly that I had, I was writing my most recent book, I had a really tough job trying to figure out what the differences meant. Nobody understands what he's talking about, right? You, I, this has nothing to do with your question. <laughs> I just wanted to get that out. Well, like, <laughs> the first time in history, you could say that, like, um, like we always pursue people have always pursued their own interests. Yes, and, and they always will, by the way. Yeah, but then, but now when people pursue their own interests, 
uh, we have means of, of industrialization yes. that cause damage to the environment. Ah, uh, whoop, whoop, hold it. <laughs> it might, it may. It has done, it may do. It may also improve things, but go ahead. Okay, yeah, so it, it probably causes a lot of damage to the environment. It may. Heavy industrialization causes the environment. <laughs> causes the environment. <laughs> so, like, you can say the pursuit, if it does, if it does cause damage, it does harm the collective good. So what is the, like how can we, if we, if we do have environmental issues, how, do, how does a libertarian solve it without working together, without having a state? Okay, your question is a very good one, and it really bears on the question of what economists call externalities. In other words, which are the costs that you generate when you, when, you, when you engage in some action or some procedure, and as it were, somebody else has to pick up the cost. The answer to that, I believe it or not, is private property. Let me give you an, an instance on this one, right? Uh, the Chinese have a saying that the common landing is no one's responsibility. Nobody sweeps the common landing, right? You walk around an area where people own their own homes, and you see the difference it makes. Let me give you an example. I grew up in Cork. When I was growing up, Balfi Han was the Job's town of its time, right? The trees were uprooted, okay? The fences were broken. Vandalism, okay? There wasn't any car theft because they didn't have any cars, right? Um, 50 years later, everybody in Badabihan owns his or her own house. The trees have grown. The grass is cut. The fences are repaired. People have extended their homes. You know why? Because it isn't just anybody else's property, it isn't somebody else's crap, somebody else has to pick up the bit. It's yours. You will look after your own property. People, some people are reckless, some people are stupid. Some people will spend everything they have and destroy their own property. Okay? You, can't, you can't legislate for human stupidity. But most human beings have a long-term investment in what they own. They have a long-term investment in their children, for example. Okay, that I don't, I'm not commoditizing your, your children, but in other words, people who have children want to have a world in which their children will actually grow and benefit. See, I don't care if the world ends 100 years now, I'll be dead, right? And so will you, okay? Unless you live to be 110, in which case you wish you were dead, right? Okay, but I have children. They will have to live in that world. And so, and so when people take a long view, when people own land and property, for example, rather than simply renting it, they look after. Which would you rather live in? Somebody's private home or some rental accommodation that students have lived in? I shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> the, answer, the answer is you will look after your own property. So if you want environmental controls, if you want clean rivers, which is what we've got now, right? Compare, compare the Liffey now to what it was 30 or 40 years ago, right? Where even walking by it and you risk dying. Okay? Uh, you may still do it. I'm, I'm not recommending you swim in it, by the way, either. It's probably not that good. But so, so externalities are dealt with, if you like, by negotiations between individuals, their communities, and so on. The whole point about the uh, libertarian vision is that it's not necessarily individualistic. Okay? One of the things you can use your freedom to do, and that you will use your freedom to do, is to associate with other people. I don't want to live in a bloody wood on my own shooting raccoons. Okay? I want to live in, in a society with other people, sharing concerns, listening to classical music, buying CDs, Okay, coming every now and then to evangelize in UCD and bring enlightenment to the... No, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. Uh, I want to do that. And this is the world in which... We, this is a libertarian world, okay? There's nothing inconsistent between cooperation, getting together, environmental concerns, uh, dealing with externalities, and libertarianism. I think uh, Rawls got quite a, a few yeah. criticisms. Got a bit of a bashing there. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, some of it, um, not entirely, you know, Rawls is a controversial figure. The difference principle is a controversial principle. Um, that, uh, you know, I don't necessarily 100% agree with everything Rawls ever said or wrote, and I'm certainly not going to contest the point that the theory of justice is uh, a boring book. It's 600 pages, and it is not what you would call light reading. Um, I certainly wouldn't recommend it for your bedside. Um, that being said, um, I think the criticism of Rawls that the, diff the difference principle and his principle of liberty aren't compatible. Um, uh, there, there are ways in which they can work. Um, I think that the only way in which they work is if we assume that liberty doesn't just mean being left alone. Um, I think the idea of liberty is a negative thing, that we just get left alone that being free is simply other people not doing anything to me and letting me do whatever I want, is a really empty conception of what it means to be free. And there's this 
common distinction between negative liberty and positive, positive liberty, and liberty of the ancients, liberty of the moderns. Um, I think sometimes libertarianism falls into this trap of being a little bit obsessed with negative liberty and with being left alone, and doesn't actually worry about the fact that part of living a human life is being able to do things um, with our liberty, and that we can't really do things if we don't have the stuff to enable us to do those things. Um, and that as a result, we do need to sort of figure out to make sure that everybody can, can get access to, to stuff, and we're all just trying to do that. Now, I'm not going to suggest that he does it perfectly. Um, I don't think anybody does. Um, the other thing I would say, just add, uh, just talking about libertarianism and the issue of property was raised. Um, libertarianism often runs into a little bit of a problem uh, with property because they need, it needs to figure out how we got it in the first place. So it needs to be able to have some sort of story about something like just initial acquisition. Um, so if I have a house in Cork, um, I need to be able to say why it's mine and not someone else's. Um, and ultimately, the answer normally comes down to sort of some sort of theoretical proposition of I combined my labour through my freedom to work um, with certain sort of land and that turned it into mine. Um, and this is sort of common, it starts with really with John Locke and there's lots of different variations of this. The problem being that when we actually look at the historical record, the vast majority of property was not acquired in this way. Property was acquired through violence, murder, theft, pillage, plunder, um, etc. Um, and so libertarianism has sort of two options at that point. One is to, to give up um, the idea of <laughs> private property. Um, the other is to do what a, a left libertarian, like a guy called Hillel Steiner, does, which is to say, okay, we have this problem. Um, we think property is important. We think individual liberty is important. Um, but the way in which we acquired all this property is not just, so we're going to need to start again. So we're going to have a 100% property tax, and we're going to distribute it all equally to everybody and start again. Um, I don't think either of these propositions is really plausible. Um, a 100% tax on property tends to be something that most libertarians don't like the idea, because taxation is apparently theft. Um, <laughs> And the other option is to, to give up. Um, I don't think they like that either. Um, so I didn't really do much defense of Rawls there. I would defend Rawls a little bit more vigorously, um, but uh, I also sort of bashed him. Just to return the favor of the Oh no, it's all in good fun. <laughs> well, if I was Rawls, I, I wouldn't think much of that particular defense. I'd be looking for somebody else to fight my case. <laughs> first of all, first of all Positive liberty is liberty. It's power, it's money, these are various other things. And they're all good, by the way. But they're not liberty. Liberty is simply liberty. Okay? It's not something else. All of these other things are good, not liberty. And by the way, uh, the, the, the Hill of Steiner 100% land tax is simply a rewarming, warming up to Henry George. Uh, uh, the single tax issue, which he generated. He was an immensely famous 19th century uh, uh, person, by the way, 19th century so on. And this idea was very sort of similar. Him. So the libertarian idea is simply this. You're absolutely right, by the way. Most acquisition of property has historically been uh, the result of pillage and war and slaughter. And here's the thing. If you could discover who actually owned, you know, assuming, by the way, if any of this is wrong, it's because somehow somebody owned something in the first place, because you can't have theft unless you have property. Unless somebody owns it, you can't steal it, can you? If somebody does, if nobody owns anything, you can't steal anything. It's quite difficult. Right? You have to have something. I can steal your necklace because it's yours, right? If you, if you didn't own it, <laughs> it wouldn't suit me, by the way. So you're okay. <laughs> so, so the whole point is that if there ever was pillage, and the pillage is wrong, as I think it is, it's only because, in some sense, somebody at some stage already owned something. It's conceptually impossible to think that pillage is wrong or pillage can actually happen if you don't have property in the first place. So the question of property ownership has actually got to predate the whole notion of pillaging and theft and all of that. So otherwise it doesn't make any sense. So that, wait, that should be reasonably clear, I think. If that's the case, the story that's told about the acquisition of property, there are many, but the Lockean story of mixing your labor uh, with stuff is one story, and it, it obviously fits in some cases. For example, if you, buy it, if you find a piece of driftwood on the beach and you carve it into uh, a, a statue of the infant Samuel at prayer or something like that, 
and uh, somebody else comes along and says, oh, I would have done something with that. You go, well, hang on a second, buddy. There's lots of driftwood. Go help yourself. I ain't stopping you. Go do it, right? But that doesn't apply to everything. It doesn't apply to your use of land. I mean, how do you, trans how do you put your labor into land? I mean, do you sort of dig a hole to fill it up again? Is that what counts? Okay, suppose that what you want in the land is not to transform it in any particular way, like Locke might want to do, okay, but simply because you admire the wonderful stand of trees that's out there. Your whole point is to leave it exactly as it is so that the birds could flourish. How can you come to own it in those circumstances, indeed, prevent the bad capitalists and libertarians like me from interfering with it? How would you do that then? Right? So the whole point is that everybody rolls, everybody, Valentine, uh, Peter Valentine, Hillel Stinner, all of the gang have some story of property and property use and property acquisition. The problem of property acquisition isn't a singularly difficult problem for libertarians. The libertarian story, however, is the one that makes the most sense. If you can, by the way, and this is the Rothbardian account, if you can trace the story of pillage, if you can trace the descent in ownership from the original owner who was dispossessed wrongly, and you could find the heirs and the signs of that person, then on libertarian principles, the property must in fact be restored to the heirs and the signs of the original owner. That would have dramatic effects, for example, in places like South America on libertarian principles. Radical, transformative effects, if you can do it. You might even try it in the north of Ireland, okay? <laughs> if you have difficulty tracing the owners, right? But if you could, go do it. So libertarian is a radical, not a fussy wussy in the position, okay? It's a serious position. Um, I imagine this might be something that uh, everyone might have an angle on, but given, um, or rather, Gavin, you mentioned in your, in your opening speech that there is no liberal party at the moment. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, case, <laughs> Mr. Gill. <laughs> um, why, why do you think that's the case? Or why do you think in general there hasn't been a movement towards uh, a libertarian party in Ireland? Or in general, why, why do these ideas not have the same kind of political fight which you might expect, given that we're, we're at a panel discussing the topic? <laughs> Was that directed to um, Just uh, both, uh, I suppose you should first. Uh, well, I've spoken a lot, so somebody else. I'll, I'll jump in and give a quick, I think there's, I think there's two parts to what you're asking. Is, um, one is why hasn't there been a development of a libertarian party and in, in, in Ireland and other areas of Europe? And the other question is, uh, well, should there be, right? Um, uh, the first answer, I think it's, a, it's a, an accident of, of history. I think Professor Casey is right here that it, it, uh, the lack of a libertarian party came about through certain historical processes. Europe has um, become more committed to some form of uh, sort of social democracy um, just through its, its experiences of war, conflict, and the Industrial Revolution, etc. All of this sort of historical milieu has produced what we've got. Um, and America has a libertarian party, and certainly the Republican Party, they're not libertarians, but there are individuals within that party that are maybe more libertarian than others, etc. There's more of a libertarianism in the States, um, although I would suggest that even the Libertarian Party, not perfectly libertarian. Um, you know, so there's there's historical reasons why different parts of the world have developed differently. So the, the sort of why has it happened that way question is a complicated sort of historical uh, story. Uh, should there be a libertarian party? Uh, it's up to libertarians. Um, get enough of them together, put together a party. Cool. I have no problem. Um, I'll let other people jump in and talk about it more. But I would be nice here. Should there be a libertarian party? Absolutely not. Dear God, no. A uh, libertarian party is a bit like an association of solipsists. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Okay, what you want to do is to destroy political parties because political parties are gangs that come together, if you like, to figure out how they're going to appropriate your property when they get power in the state. The last thing you want to do is to be one of these people. Okay, so please stay away from political parties. Okay, even a libertarian party, no sooner does it have a libertarian party and then they immediately start compromising on the libertarian principles. There's no way you can do it. You cannot touch pitch and not be defiled. Stay away from it, right? Well, our aim is to destroy the state, to remove the state, to remove political parties, not just to become another blasted part of the enterprise. The last, that's the last. You, you want to get rid of, you want to get somebody to stop really being a libertarian? You know the best way to do it? Have them join the libertarian party. Yeah, absolutely. Bad idea. 
There are other types of libertarianism, Director. No, well, there are, yeah. sort of advocates the minimum state. Are you completely yeah, no, anarchistic? Then? Yeah, no, no, Nozick is seriously confused. Let me make this point. Nozick is an exceptionally brilliant individual. Nozick is the kind of annoying guy who has more ideas in the morning after, before he's had his coffee than most human beings have in their entire life. The trouble with Nozick is that he never pushes through on most of these ideas. He starts off his anarchy state in utopia by saying there, there are things that no one may do to you, whatever happens. And then we talk about this really strong conception of rights. It is absolutely stunning. It is the most, one of the most impressive opening sentences in any book. And yet he tries to show that on libertarian principles, you have to move from libertarianism to a minimal state, right? And the, re and the way he does that, he makes a serious and completely unprecedented uh, 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 concession. He says at times, there are things that nobody can do to you. But then he says, well, in certain circumstances, they actually can do them to you, provided they compensate them, you for them. And the answer is, no, 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 no. Or resource scarcity. If I, if I value something, right, and I really value it, and you want to take it from me, and you say, oh, look, I'm going to take it from you, but I'll compensate. It's as if somebody were to break into your house and steal your TV and say, oh, no, don't worry about it. Look, I'll, I'll compensate you for it. You say, compensate my ass. I want my TV, right? <laughs> Stay out of my house, right? There are things, and there is no way again, and this is this fatal mistake, by the way, in the book. It's a brilliant book, by the way. And if you're reading it, read the last section, which nobody ever gets to. Okay, it's anarchy state in utopia. Read the last section where he makes the point that almost everybody who thinks about libertarianism, and I always think about music, right, misses, which is that there is no one libertarian world. In, the, in a libertarian world, as it were, everybody is free to associate with those who, in, in any way, you can, have the, you can have your Marxists over here and your hippies over here and your beach bums, and there are a lot of pro, a lot of, uh, you know, pu pushing for those tonight, over here, okay, <laughs> your, con your conservatives over here, your religious freaks over here, your gun nuts over here, you can have many of them, right? Some of them will kill themselves, some of them will starve to death, okay, just out of sheer stupidity, great, it's good, okay, the world needs few people, obviously, as you we heard from our last speaker, uh, okay, uh, but yeah, that's in the, there is no one way. Right? The whole point about freedom is you're free to associate and disassociate. And I have to say, at this stage of my life, okay, there are so many idiots in this world okay, that I spend more of my time dissociating than I do associating. I should have done it a lot earlier in my life as well. It made life easier. So I said, Nozick, the problem with Nozick, okay, apart from being brilliant, which he is, and he did a lot of work, by the way, after Anarchy State in Utopia, nobody ever reads it. Okay, it must be really annoying. He died at the age of 63, and if he's anywhere now, he's going, bloody hell. Why did I write those books? No one ever read them, right? The trouble, however, with Nozick is that when people who don't know anything else about political philosophy think about libertarians, they always think of Robert Nozick. And Nozick is a roadblock. Most of the serious work in libertarianism has been done by people other than wrote Nozick. You've got to get Nozick out of your way, brilliant as he is, and interesting as he is, but wrong as he is, so that you can see the real work that's been done by others. A uh, question about brawls. I remember when I tried to read it, it was pretty boring, yeah. <laughs> I, I got to the point where I started asking people I knew what they would do with their whole uh, veil of ignorance. But one of the questions I asked my family was, would you stop people with genetic advantages from getting, getting those genetic advantages? So they didn't choose to have them. It's extremely unequal that some people are ridiculously good at sports. They just are. There's no real way of compensating with that. Some people could work every day in their lives to try and train for the sport, but someone would just be taller or better at certain things. So those people don't deserve those things. They're taken away from them. And do you think that was, do you think that the idea that Rawls kind of almost denied self-ownership was a mistake, or do you think that it was something that's key to the philosophy? So I, I don't think he necessarily decides the nice self-ownership. I think what he does do is he sort of says that there's certain things about people that they haven't done anything to earn. And he says that, yeah, some people will be, you know, really good at and knows it has the famous Will Chamberlain example at uh, basketball, and you'll be able to make lots of money from that. Um, and Rawls wants to say, sure, right, you should be able to, if you're willing to work hard and you have certain skills, talents, and abilities that are, are valued, you should be able to to benefit from that. All Rawls then wants to say is that 
you know, for example, Will Chamberlain is a basketball player. He existed in a particular society that particularly valued basketball. Um, and within, so within that sort of scheme of social cooperation, um, he was particularly valued. And he benefited massively from being an American um, who was good at basketball. Um, so he should be able to benefit from that, but also he, everybody in society should be able to benefit from that scheme of social cooperation. Um, so if we have a society that likes basketball um, and we're willing to pay lots of money to go and, and watch someone like Will Chamberlain do it, then grant, we're all says, yep, yeah, make your money, but you're not going to be able to make so much your money to such an extent that other people get left behind by our scheme of social cooperation. But the problem is then, I think, is that you don't decide a lot of things. You don't decide, well, society decides that hard work is important or that being good looking is important. These things you don't have any decision over, so you don't deserve them, anything you get from them. So at a certain point, I remember he said that you shouldn't justify things on um, moral desert, it's legitimate expectations. I remember telling this to everyone in my family, they thought it was extremely weird because all of a sudden they thought everything that they were, they no longer deserved. Nothing was, no one deserved any injustice and no one deserved anything extra. Everyone just got legitimate expectations. And I thought everyone I knew was instantly, they were wild at the thought that everything couldn't be boiled down to that, that they didn't deserve things. And like a lot of people in college now, everyone here doesn't deserve to go to college in the royalty in theory. They just have a legitimate expectation to because they were born in Ireland. So I think, so where the, maybe a little bit of confusion arises, I think Rawls, he does think people deserve things, right? So if, if, I, you know, so if I'm born with incredible talent at basketball, but I decide, you know what, I just can't be arsed, then I don't get the benefits from that. If I, however, am born with massive talent to play basketball, and I'm like, yes, I'm going to go and use this, I deserve to, to reap some reward from that. I deserve some benefit. I, I, and I, um, everybody sort of, for, for roles, you can deserve things. You can earn things um, by working hard or doing whatever. Um, and somebody who maybe has lesser talent and ability can still uh, deserve what they, the sort of the fruits of their labor. Um, I think what Rawls is trying really to do is to say that we exist in a sort of a social sphere. Um, we exist in a society where certain things are valued, certain things aren't. Um, we deserve some things, we don't necessarily deserve everything. Um, you know, I would say everybody in this room, um, assuming you're all sort of university students, you all deserve to be at university because you worked hard to get here, right? You, there are certain things you did that you worked hard. Now, that being said, Rawls would say there are certain abilities you had that you were born with that you did no nothing to earn. Um, and so he wants to try and make sure that there is some sort of um, fairness in the social system to ensure that maybe people that are born with skills that aren't as valued by society can still benefit from being part of society. People born with skills that are valued by society can also benefit from being part of society. He's really concerned with trying to make sure everybody gets something out of this thing, um, out of doing society, and that, that, that nobody is sort of left uh, behind to a degree. He wants to try and make sure that all of the boats are going to rise with the tide um, to an extent. So he does think you can deserve things, um, but that there are certain things that are, are morally arbitrary that you just have by just, it's, it's just a brute fact. Um, and he wants to try and try and remove those morally arbitrary factors from our reasoning when we think about how uh, to come up with principles of justice. We might just finish with uh, one last question. Oh, yeah. uh, so, uh, so the difference principle, as I understand it, says that it, it's only morally permissible uh, for economic inequality uh, to exist if they were towards uh, helping the, the worst off in society. Um, it sounds like you're a very risk averse person in this in this type, type, type of thing. I know I know people that would bet on coin flips. You know, I know people that put coins into slot machines, which is much worse, by the way. You know, <laughs> so it's like. Some people would choose to go for you know that one chance of being the rich guy. Um, does Rawls have a, a quick, like an answer to that, or is it just because he's risk averse that he thinks everyone should be like that? So, I mean, this is a, a common and not, not uh, necessarily entirely unfair criticism of one of the things Rawls does. He assumes behind the field of ignorance you don't know whether you'll be risk averse or not. So you don't. He assumes that we don't know our own moral psychology. Um, uh, since we don't know, am I risk averse? Am I uh, a risk taker? Am I an adrenaline junkie, etc.? Um, and this is one of the arguments 
common pudding as well is that you're sort of removing an important component of the way in which people think and by putting them into the, when you go into the original position and that you shouldn't do this, that we should know if we're risk averse or not. Um, it's one of those ones where I'm probably not the best person to ask about the, the strength of these criticisms because I tend to think that actually most people are somewhere in the middle. Most people are a bit risk averse and most people will take the odd risk role and sort of by removing that sort of moral psychology component and saying, okay, let's get principles that sort of serve for pretty much everybody and sort of allow you when you get out of the veil of ignorance, if you are a, a risk taker, you can go and take your risks and you can go and engage in, in, in risky behaviour, but that he wants to design a society whereby it's not designed for risk takers. Um, it's designed to allow people to take risks if they so wish. Um, but also to make sure that if you do take risks, that you're not then going to starve to death because of them. Um, <coughs> some people might say, let them starve. I, I, I would tend not to, but... <laughs> 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 there's, a, there's a deeper problem, which is this. Our, our normal idea of choice evolves to human beings. Human beings have needs, desires, and interests, right? So when we think about choosing things, we think about choosing things because we like certain kinds of things, we don't like other kinds of things. What Rawls does is absolutely incoherent. He removes from the people behind the veil of ignorance everything that makes them human, right? There is no way they can actually choose anything in any coherent sense. It's absolutely meaningless, okay? Unless, of course, they're all Harvard and MIT zombies, which is effectively what you get, okay? Because I don't know that they have any needs, desires, and interests. That seems to be the kind of people he associates with. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being scathing about this, but there, there is a serious point. What he's done is he's designed the thought experiment. The thought experiments are acceptable in philosophy, but the further they go away from reality, the less traction they have, okay? And the character, the character less mess, of the people behind all the veil of ignorance is such that it makes no sense to think of them as choosing anything. What do they choose with? We choose because we like things. So they have no likes. They have no character. They have no knowledge of politics. It's just crazy. It's nonsense. It is one of these thought experiments <laughs> that should really be put out of its misery, taken off the life support machine, decently buried. Okay. Story. I agree with you on the, the original position. Uh, it is nonsensical, but we might be placing too much emphasis on it. It is a thought experiment. It's central to his thought. It's, it's absolutely central, central to the whole book. But he's advocating certain principles that we can accept yeah. as principles or other On the basis of the way of ignorance, on the basis of That's his way of getting us there. But yeah, no, but, yeah, but, his, but if, he, if he doesn't justify it in this way, he's got to justify it in some other way. Or, okay. or he can just write right. some other way, but he's dead, so he's not in any position to do it. <laughs> so he, he lived, he lived on this for 40 years, right? And during this time, he got like millions and millions and millions of criticism. And he never, but never, gave up on the centrality, if you like, on the central thought experiment. So he didn't do it, right? So we're talking about laws, not about some other third party. So it is possible to justify them in some other way, possibly. Okay? Although I think it's still incoherent, I still think the two of them don't go together. It just doesn't work. Right? <coughs> but yeah, go for it. I mean, hey, this is a big world, you want to make a fool of yourself? Plenty of space out there to do it. Not least in academia. <laughs> So for Mark says a few words, I just want to thank Tess for helping to organise this and all our speakers for coming to speak to us. And um, we'll be having a reception in the long stone after this. So thank you guys very much. Mm -hmm. Certainly very contentious, but also very, very interesting indeed. I mean, liberal, liberalism and libertarianism um, and a general political philosophy isn't something which is often discussed uh, in Trinity and, and by societies, so it's nice to get a unique perspective on that. Um, Trinity Economic Forum is a two-day economic forum, and that's our primary event, and it's held on the 2nd and 3rd of February this year. And basically what we do is we bring together like, uh, economists uh, political scientists 
and otherwise from around the world to discuss a variety of economic and political issues. And the whole intention is to have this kind of discourse of ideas uh, and a collection of ideas in quick succession so that you're getting a broad approach. Uh, uh, because, of course, economics and politics is very broad. <laughs> Um, so we've lectures from LSC in Oxford this year, um, and we also have panels on things like housing, you know, applied preferences for economics, so housing, um, as well as like more theoretical in terms of like how should economic ideas be communicated <coughs> with the public. Uh, and then we also have keynote speakers, uh, and I'm excited to announce two of them being Ali Ren, who is the former uh, European Commissioner for uh, the monetary, monetary Affairs in the Euro uh, from 2009 to 2014. Of course, uh, Ali Ren was heavily involved in Ireland during the bank bailout, and he's a heavily contra he's a controversial figure, but he's also one who's viewed uh, of extreme importance. Uh, and then our other keynote is uh, American reporter Stacey Bannock Smith from NPR's Planet Money. Uh, NPR's Planet Money, as I'm sure some of you are aware, is the largest economics podcast uh, in, in the world. Uh, and it's very exciting to host someone who's been so influential in communicating economic ideas. Um, just um, two other things. One, we're taking volunteers in January, so just as soon as uh, term next term starts, we'll be taking volunteers for the forum. We should take on about 15 volunteers. These people get to chaperone uh, our guests and also get to help with the organization of the logistics of the forum and participate in our workshops. It's great, you get a free ticket, of course, uh, and then you also get to uh, attend and talk to the speakers outside of the event. And then um, finally, <coughs> We produce a magazine uh, which consists of the both our guest speakers and student submissions. And student submissions for our magazine will open soon. It's typically an opinion piece on an economic or political issue um, which you see appropriate. And then, and then uh, we essentially cycle through, cycle through them and see which ones are the best. Uh, finally, I'd just like to thank our sponsors, of course, because um, TEF is almost entirely. Uh, independently funded, which means that we are heavily reliant on our sponsors. Um, in particular, I'd like to thank the National Project Managers Agency and uh, the Near Institute, uh, Trinity Alumni, uh, by, uh, the Tr Trinity Alumni Office, uh, for providing us with the funding to be able to host these events. Thank you.